<laughs> I'm Rebecca Katz. Um, I am a professor and I direct the Center for Global Health Science and Security at, at Georgetown. Um, I, I did spend 10 years in this school and I, I, I would note that I think the very first event in this room uh, was in September 2014 where we held an event for the global health security agenda. So just going to plug, plug that from once upon a time. And has the security agenda been a success? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a whole nother question. <laughs> um, that'll get me in a lot of trouble. Um, yes, but it shouldn't continue. That's my quick answer. I think, you know, so I was asked to, to say a few words about, about funding in the health security space. And I think the, the, the top line is that, no, there's, there's never been sufficient funding. There is not currently sufficient funding. And we need a lot more money. Um, to be able to build sufficient capacity to be able to prevent, detect, and respond to, to public health emergencies. Um, we've been tracking the global financing in health security since about 2014. And over that time, we've, there's been about a little over $200 billion, again, from 14 to, to 2021. Um, in funding that has gone to building core capacities for health security as defined by the, the, the international health regulations, and as well as to the main public health emergencies of international concern, the declared FIEX. Um, of that, $75 billion has been in bilateral, government to government, Another 80 billion has gone through um, from NGOs or IOs, with the nations being the primary contributors to those funds. And then about 17 billion has been from philanthropies. The need, though, we we did we we've also been doing some work over the years on costing. What does it actually cost to to build these capacities as they've been defined by the WHO? And our latest assessment was that at the country level, to meet the, the to meet the obligations of having this sufficient capacity as defined by the WHO, and we could debate for, well, I could debate for hours over whether these are the right metrics to be using. But given that, we've came up with a, with a number of about $124 billion is still required, the majority of that in in, in about 76 countries. Um, and, and that's separate from the approximately 80 billion that's been estimated to be required for kind of those global goods. And now global goods is a complicated term, but you know things like R&D and manufacturing capacity and supply chain and some of the governance issues, that's also separate from the separate conversations that are being had around increasing assessed contributions at the WHO and again our, our institutional systems. So so there's a there's a lot that's still required. And I think that, you know, as we think about what does that look like going forward, it's the importance of mixing both um, the international community and coming up with the the financing, the bilateral, the through the channels of international organizations, um, through and uh, through this uh, soon to be formed fifth um, a new financing facility at the World Bank for when well, I get this right, if I read it, I, the Pandemic Preparedness and Global Health Security Financial Intermediary Fund, like rolls off the tongue, right? Um, <laughs> so. So you know what? So the money that will come through that, what bilateral assistance looks like, but also um, it's going to require national level investment, and you know, we actually have no way of tracking that right now. It's not in national health accounts to be able to track the the funding in in the health security space, but um, we also know that. International donors can come in and for the, all the goodwill in the world and say, you know, we want to give you X amount of dollars to build a lab, for example, but unless the country wants the lab, it doesn't happen or it's wasted. Um, 
I mean, the lab in Goma is a really wonderful example of like a national level interest and, and a country saying that this is something we want to do and then it thrives. And I think that finding that right balance between what the, the, the needs as defined by the country and then being able to match that to um, both national level investments as well as global investments are going to be critical going forward. So, so I think the, the, the long answer is, yeah, we need a lot of money. Um, there's a lot of need out there. And we still have a challenge with, with prioritization and making sure that this stays something that countries are and, and entities are willing to invest in. Thanks, thanks Rebecca. Um, let me just ask one question, and then I'm going to see if there are any questions in the uh, audience. Um, how can we begin to see the humanitarian response funding that comes from the U.S. government, from ECHO in the European Commission and other agencies, how can we transform that into preparedness money rather than into response money? Is there a way to do that? And can, can anyone have any influence on that? You know, I, I sit behind a computer most of my time, right? So, and so when I, I'm looking at the, the flows of those dollars coming in and how you map those, and, and as you know, some of that money is preparedness, right? So if you're, if you're going in and you are, and, and, and there's money that is flowing to, say, strengthen IPC, it's not like the outbreak ends and you forget what IPC is or you forget what that training was. Um, but it, it's, it's not easy to capture. Um, and it, it operates in kind of this gray area of what, of what is needed immediately in a response and then how to continue building capacity after that. I don't know the answer. I, if I knew the answer to the second part of your question, I'd, I'd, have, I'd have done it. Right? <laughs> um, well, so maybe we need to band together from around the world and try to do it. It may work sometime. Tom, do you have any anything to say about that? Are you still with us? Uh, 